Okay. Um, welcome to uh, 42 Degrees Igniting Conversation and Action. Fergus, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Lana. It's a real pleasure to be invited to have a chat with you. Um, so my name is Fergus. Um, I am from the UK. Uh, I work for the British government uh, as a humanitarian advisor. Um, I am not, I'm not really, don't really define as being gay or straight. I don't really care about um, gender identity, but I don't know I'm brave enough to say that I'm non-binary either. Um, I'm going to be a dad soon. And yeah, I'm really trying to give up things that are bad for the planet, which is quite easy apart from dairy. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Oh. Yeah. Fergus, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh... Oh. No, you're on mute. <laughs> Oh, sorry, a bit of teething troubles there. I think because there's a button here for muting, and then there's also a muting system on this that, yeah, might be a bit of a problem. Maybe I won't touch my button at all. Okay. <laughs> so did you get my intro? I did. Um, and cool. I don't eat dairy at all because I'm lactose intolerant. So um, um, okay. I am trying to wow. get a little bit better with the environment. Um, so my name's Lana and I am uh, the co-founder of Edge Effect and the co-CEO of 42 Degrees and I'm deeply passionate about participatory practices with an emphasis on inclusion, participation, belonging and leadership. I think that's how I would like to describe myself. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so firstly, actually, before we start, I do want to just acknowledge that we're, I'm speaking from a place that we call Melbourne, which long before this colonial name was called Birrung. And I acknowledge the first and continuing custodians of this land, the Indigenous people of the Woiwurrung and Burrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. And I just want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So we're going to talk about localization today. Um, I've been wanting to have a really good discussion about localization. Um, is this Great. weird for you to have a discussion about localization? Um, uh, it's it's a uh, a real pleasure. Um, I do spend quite a lot of time thinking about localization, um, but uh, never an opportunity to talk with my sisters from down under um, and I'm con constantly um, struck and, and, and refreshed by conversations I've been having by with, with my colleagues uh, that I've met over the years from your part of the world and um, so and, and I do think that there's some really cool thought going on in the in the localization space um, in in the southern hemisphere that we in the northern hemisphere really need to learn about so I'm pretty pretty excited about this conversation Ah, I feel like it's a little bit of a buzzword. It's something that I hear again and again and again, localization, localization, localization. Sure. Do you, but, do you hear what, it a lot? Everybody's got, uh, yeah, no, I think it's, you know, um, it, it's something that, that kind of was, was really f uh, forefront of the, of the World Humanitarian Summit back in 2016. And I think that the discourse has moved on um, to realizing that it is pretty much the, the crux of everything that we need, everything that's not working in the, in the system and everything that needs to, needs to be fixed uh, is in some way or another um, orbiting around localization, right? Mm. Um, and, and, and if we, if we don't, essentially go back and step back and look philosophically at who we are, our identity as humanitarians, um, and realize that we are essentially still in a system that's very much about a uh, hierarchy, a patriarchy um, that doesn't empower the local actors, 
And until we don't realize that kind of deeply in a philosophical level, I don't know how we're going to actually get to changing the system and to really making sure that that we are empowering communities and empowering people um, and transferring power and letting go of power and resources, mm. which is really what localization is, is about, right? So yeah. it's the big, it is the big issue for, yeah. for sure. Um, it's interesting that you say about changing the systems because I guess I think a big part of edge effects work is about changing the system, but also I want to acknowledge one of my favorite books, um, which I actually used and read, How Change Happens in the Humanitarian Sector by the CHS Alliance. And in here on page 43, under localization, it says the term localization does not have a standard definition within the humanitarian discourse. Indeed, one of the key challenges in discussing this area is that different organizations hold different interpretations of what it means and that these are still evolving. Hmm. And I feel like sometimes when I talk about it, other people, uh, it's like we're, we're having a different conversation. What does localization, do you think we should have one definition? Um, or is that, is that, is that actually anti-localization? Yeah, so there is that strand of recognizing how heterogeneous communities are and, 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 how, and, and, and how we have to see the diversity of the communities and the families and the individuals that we work with and celebrate that. And, 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 and so to, to, to a level, it is quite nuanced, isn't it? And, and, and hard to say one thing for what localization is. If you ask me personally, and this is not wearing a hat as a British uh, civil servant, I'd say that we, I think we're overthinking it. I think we're overcomplicating it. I think we need to look back to where we come from as a community, um, where we come from as people who thought about um, rights, inclusion, bringing everybody along, doing no harm, all of those basic things. And if we come back to really a kind of a development centered approach to thinking about humanitarian, um, we will find the answers to what, what localization is. The humanitarian community has been fetishizing this, have been obsessing with it, have been feeling really negative about localization, feeling defeated. Um, but actually, it, it, isn't it just the nexus? Isn't, isn't localization about sound, inclusive development practice? And, and I think, um, I think we, we we need to just step back and we need to you know get out of our silo and 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 learn and go back and, and you know read Gandhi go back and read Schumacher you know that that it's not about macro and it's not about um, delivering at scale and you know the development is 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 small is beautiful and the impacts that we want to change and and sorry the impacts that we want to see and the changes we want to see in society are about justice and about uh, individual um, changes. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it, it needs a bit of demystification, don't you? Um, I, I like where you're going and I like what you're thinking, except I think for me sometimes when we're not taking a cookie cutter approach, what happens is things become... And become localized, but that means that they become specific to a local context that you can't scale up, that you can't necessarily replicate. And so that means that it, it, it almost seems like it is something that is contradictory to the way in which funders and big kind of UN and INGO bodies um, expect us to work. And so I guess maybe it might be good to, to kind of just acknowledge that we also want to talk about people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities and expressions and think about what that means, you know, when we're talking about different types of localization or how local is local. So if we're mm -hmm. working with governments um, and 
you know, I got an email today querying about a piece of work that we could be doing and they wanted to focus on national and subnational levels. And what that might mean for some people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. What if at that national level, there is laws against, um, or laws that target, um, I guess, uh, people with diverse sexual orientation. So is gay sex um, between men and between women illegal? Or um, propaganda laws, you know, saying that we can't, we can't show and talk about sexuality or gender identity on a national level. And then thinking about somewhere like Indonesia, where at a, at a general broad national level, there is no, for example, sodomy laws, but in a regional level in Aceh, there's Islamic Sharia law. And so just taking for a moment, looking at that big picture of localization, you know what, I start to feel a little bit uncomfortable with the term knowing that that might mean that we need to think about discrimination against the people that are most marginalized in the humanitarian response. That feels hard. Yeah. Really, really tough. So it's a really, really interesting question. And I, I yeah, I, I do think about this quite a lot. Um, I, 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 I don't really, you know, on a philosophical level, believe in many absolutes. Um, and I, and I think you're saying, you know, that, that we're talking here about, you know, cultural relativism or relativism of values, um, that, that makes, you know, that makes doing some of this stuff really hard. But I, think as humanitarians um we we do we do have our our canon our kind of values that we hold very strongly and i think those are all about um recognizing rights that's the rights-based approach it's the humanitarian principles um and and you know if we really do say that we're people who believe in uh neutrality uh humanity mm -hmm. um those you know those core values as you i think i think as as you and emily articulated very well in that recent paper in in alnap um that that you must be alive to the rights uh, of of people so that there are some absolutes right mm. we don't live in a totally gray world although most of the things we have to deal with are so convoluted and and complex and 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 and, and contradictory but mm. I, I think I think on some of these issues we come down very clearly that within a discourse, if we are marginalizing, ignoring, if we're working in structures um, that exclude large proportions, and 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 I kind of disagree with something that you wrote um, or that Emily wrote in in one of those papers, saying that um, the uh, LGBTIQ community is often small. I think they're never small. They are hidden they are invisible they are marginalized but they're never small and they're always a significant part of any community or any any um human population uh, and to marginalize them then is 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 a, is a gross um act of negligence i think by the humanitarian community um and and you mentioned C the chs alliance and the chs um is i think very very useful uh, as a kind of a a canon, um, and I think uh, I, I'm certainly talking to CHS about LGBT um, people and and looking at look, looking at their inclusion in this in 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 our work. Um, look at I mean my experience. I, so I worked in in in, in India in the 90s um, and and started supporting some of that work to repeal the colonial um, anti-homosexuality laws in India. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of these legislations and um, governmental structures that marginalise and penalise people for their uh, sexual orientation are, are colonial implants. I see that so often in in African contexts um, as well that that they are still using outdated laws that existed from from the, the British penal codes, right? Hmm. Um, and that 
in indigenous cultures, indigenous um, societies, um, although, yeah, I would say superficially are beginning to be changed by movements like, you know, evangelical Christian organizations in, in Central Africa and, um, and, and in East Africa. Um, the underlying acceptance and understanding that some that people have a diverse spectrum of sexualities is, is there. And so in a way, I think part of the problem is one that we created through the colonial process, um, mm. in, you know, imposing a very um, punitive, um, very draconian set of laws into societies that just that was not part of their their culture and there was much more fluidity in in sexual um expression and relationships um which was sort of you know stamped out during colonialism i, I probably i'm simplifying massively right but i still think we have a responsibility or i as a a product of the you know the white anglo-saxon well actually i'm irish so i'm not a, really a white anglo-saxon i'm also colonized to an extent but um, we have a responsibility to redress and still talk about our colonial legacy and our colonial responsibility and our colonial guilt. Mm, yeah, um, I will move on and, and start breaking down under the subnational. But before I do that, I just want to let um, our audience know that they can use the Q&A box to, to start asking us some questions about what you think we would like to or you would like us to explore in our conversation today. But to follow on from, from what you've just said, Fergus, I think it's really interesting because I think that a lot of organisations say to us, oh, we can't possibly work with people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities because it is illegal or because there's criminalisation in particular places. And there's lots mm. of examples where, yes, those laws are on the books, but they're there is a burgeoning um, social movement within uh, within countries that those laws aren't um, being practiced. And particularly, you know, you mentioned Africa and the penal laws, and absolutely that's true. But if you, you know, start to look at some of the some of the places in Africa, for example, in Cameroon, where you might go, oh, look, it's it's too restrictive there. There's a, an LGBTIQ plus rights network um, called Unity Platform, which represents over 30 LGBTIQ plus CSOs. Or Uganda has um, SMUG, which represents 11 groups nationally. Or in Kenya, there's GALAC that represents 15 organizations. Um, and, you know, that's just Africa. I, I did mention, yeah. of course, um, Indonesia and um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you, but there's, you know, probably 15, 20 CSOs, LGBT CSOs mm. there. And so when we mm. start to think about localization and we start to kind of dig deeper, we start to see mm. that there's, you know, there's a lot of space to be able to work really closely with the LGBT mm. CSOs in the work that yeah. we do as a practitioner. Can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. Um, my my perception is 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 that we do make a mistake of of kind of trying to group all these people together when they don't necessarily have that much in common. True. Uh, and, and I wondered if if you could reflect on on those sort of challenges of how how do you how do you kind of do work on advocacy and support and 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 um psychosocial support and all of those things with a group of, with a group that itself isn't really a group and it's very heterogeneous and, and and pulls against being you know lumped together as the lgbtiq bunch yeah well you've hit on an amazing question um and i think the first thing is to admit that we're not one homogenous group um you know there's an absolute difference between gender and sexuality and then there's an absolute difference between the lived experiences of women who are homosexual, women who are bisexual, um, women who are trans, um, gender non-conforming folk, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. And so I think the first thing is acknowledging that 
we're not one homogenous group. And then if you think about, say, for example, um, you know, Kenya, um, and we're thinking about, um, you know, we've got Kenyan uh, people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. You have refugees from um, Sudan and Ethiopia, which not only have different cultural identities, they have different languages, they have different experiences, um, you know, or Lebanon, we're thinking about um, Syrian refugees, Iraqi refugees, and so added on top of maybe homophobia and transphobia and um, those kinds of social marginalizations, you have racism, you have lack of access for services, um, all sorts of things going on. And so, I think this is where the other big buzzword besides localization is, is about genuinely working intersectionally um, and that actually working in a really considered approach with local communities based on their specific needs and their specific strengths, then you're probably doing localization as I understand it. Right, right. Mm. Which is kind of anti the discourse of um, taking stuff to scale and, you know, taking small innovation and making it big. You're actually talking about celebrating lots of smallness, which is actually, mm. you know, for a um, for a UN agency or for a donor, quite hard to understand, right? Because you're asking basically to spend more time, more money, uh, more resourcing, um, on a process that is recognizing that individual and community-based uh, need to 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 appropriate to, to to deliver, and I guess that you know the trick is now how are we gonna how are we gonna come up with a, a modality of delivering humanitarian um, in a way that um, is to scale and is meeting the needs and we know that humanitarian needs are ever increasing and and with um uh, with the current you know re global recession humanitarian needs are going to be under under focus for so this is uh, this is a really hard pitch to make but one i think is essential if we want to continue as humanitarians right um yeah it's certainly an issue that we have because not only um not only are we working in a, in a space where people feel really uncomfortable, but also we're a really, really small organisation. So we can't do these mega huge, you know, $10 million projects. We actually just don't have the capacity to do that. But I, mm. I, want, to, I want to maybe, you know, say I don't agree with you when, or, or with the world or with the sectors when we say that it's additional resourcing because... The reality is, is that I started my work in the 90s. Um, yes, i am you know, been around for that long. And, but I came out of uni, I came from a place, and I feel silly saying this, where I truly believed that my job was to work myself out of a job. That's what, mm. you know, development practitioners are meant to do, right? And, mm. you know, now, you know, several decades later, I, I look around and go, that's never going to happen. But if we worked, and, and I do sometimes work really small, really locally, um, and I have had some real success in working with communities that when I leave, they continue to do the work because mm. that's, that's how we've set up the project. And... Mm. Yes, it, it seemed to cost a little bit more up front, but on the longer term, it costs a lot less. And in terms of that resourcing, maybe we're just looking in, at it the wrong way because mm. there is an expertise that is there, particularly in crisis-affected communities, and that, that resource and that expertise is something that you know, I have a valid place, so I have a valid expertise, and that expertise is really important, but that's not the same expertise as people in crisis-affected communities. Mm. 
Um, mm. And if I give a, a really local example of my own, um, I lived in the country for a long time. We had really horrific fires. Um, and I was one year at the local fire station doing my fire training in case I get caught in a fire. And, you know, the, the fire is telling me all the things that I need to do when I get caught in a fire. And one of the local community members, and in this community, there's only 250 people living. It's a small rural community. And they said, oh, look, if we get stuck, should we go to the river? And the fire is like, oh, never thought about that. Doesn't seem like a bad idea. You know, the fire is never at the river when a big fire is happening. He's at or they are at the front mm. line of the fire in the forest or, mm. or in the farmland. And a mm. local person said, oh, no, no, I got caught in the big fires. I went to the river and every single animal was in that river. You know, the big deer, the snakes, everything was in that river. I wasn't going to mm. die from the fire. I was going to die from, <laughs> from the animals. And that is a piece of, you know, it's just a small story, but a piece of expertise mm. of you only mm. know that if you're in that crisis or if you've been in that crisis. You don't know that if you are got a different type of expertise. And so I mm. guess it really comes down to working locally, for me, working mm. locally with small communities, um, which I love doing and I sometimes do get to do, always acknowledging that they have very specific relevant expertise and they are my partner in this. Um, I'm not doing anything to them, um, mm. but we're working together in tandem with our own expertise to create local work that supports them long after I'm gone. And that kind of resource is invaluable yeah yeah and 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 so and to sort of dress that up in humanitarian emergency language they're the first responders yeah they're the first people on the scene we're yeah. you know we've got to get away from this idea that we're the knights in shining armor coming in the mm. people who are the real heroes the local people who know their land they know the risk analysis they know where the resources are, they 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 know how to manage, and they're incredibly resilient. Um, and we we none of our technical knowledge or cluster coordination skills or any of that stuff comes anywhere near, right? No, it's always the it's always the mothers group or the LGBT group or the church group that's there on the ground delivering the assistance at the beginning. So I think the question and the revolution that needs to happen is let's lose the white savior completely let's forget that model the the model that we have to have is is about resilience preparedness localization to use the jargon of humanitarianism right mm. it's about yeah. long-term development commitments to communities about building up trust um about giving them the tools the whole area that you know i'm very interested in is is um is risk insurance and you know this whole thesis of most disasters are very dull because you predict them um and if you've you know if you've got risk financing risk insurance around humanitarian risks um in place that give that pay out very quickly to communities um that they can get on and and and, and, and get back to normalcy so for me that's you know it's like a localization whatever language you want to use re resilience preparedness you know risk financing these things are all kind of kind of faces of a mountain uh, of, of, of a kind of a model that we need to we need to move to which is again you know just coming back to basic development thinking right mm. uh, and, and trust building and i think i really really appreciate what you said about um about this approach being more costly um I think most of the evidence is that if you invest in this kind of programming in the long term, you will save money because the cost of um, a stitch in time in terms of emergency response, right, mm. is, 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 is minimal compared to the vastly expensive and hugely inefficient way of a bunch of white aid workers jumping in a plane with a huge carbon footprint and landing in this country and frankly, 
um, doing often more harm than good, right? Mm. Yeah. So I think yeah. we 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 need to start thinking about how this is an investment in the future. And uh, you know what? If we invest in this modality of sustainable community-owned work, then we're also going to have an impact on climate change because yes. the response model that we have now is is one of the most polluting and the waste that's generated um, is just inconscionable and we should not be doing this anymore as a community if we really claim to care about climate change yeah i guess so i guess we're not here to talk about climate change today <laughs> oh no well you know it's hard not to talk about both of those things but i guess you know I, one of the complexities <coughs> is I feel like we're back towards the beginning of the discussion. You know, if I think about mm. um, if I think about Vanuatu, there's some really interesting things that that pop up, and one is that you know aid workers don't even know themselves how they discriminate. And if I'm thinking about after mm. Cyclone Pam and talking to local communities, um, local diverse OGS communities. Um, the trans community was saying that after Cyclone Pam, where there were food distribution lines, um, there were male lines and female lines. And mm. because of strict coherence of, of um, gender roles, um, because of the stigma and discrimination that existed, they didn't feel like the aid community would allow them in either of those lines. And they didn't think that the local population who were lining up in those lines would allow them in there. And so they just didn't go and they supported each other instead finding food elsewhere rather than aid. And then I think um, another really interesting piece is after Cyclone Harold at the beginning of last year, um, Vanuatu is a really interesting country that hasn't had any cases of COVID, but they shut their borders so that they didn't get any. And it was considered um, a prime example of localization because the response to Cyclone Harold had to be within the country. But we worked alongside a local LGBT organization um, and they went to Santos where the main site of the disaster was and they interviewed people and not one people, not one person within the diverse OGS community said that they had had anyone do a rapid needs assessment. Um, and so I guess this is one of the really challenging things is that we need to think about how we work with local response communities and first responders to also think about how to work and how to respond to diverse OGS communities. And that's not to say that they're the only people we have to work with because the humanitarian system itself doesn't do it either. So this isn't, you know, something of, oh, only in this country, you know, this is widespread. There's lots of examples where local communities do do that response for local um, diverse OGS folks because the humanitarian system doesn't as well. But I guess one of the real challenges here is that we're working in, we're working in a space where, you know, there is about 74 countries that criminalise um, gay people where, um, you know, LGBT people aren't included in the Sustainable Development Goals or in any international humanitarian policy. And so we do need to take a, a multi-layered approach to think about how we do do um, humanitarian inclusion or LGBTIQ plus inclusion in humanitarian response, both at the local level and at the global level. Absolutely. Now I was just thinking, it's got to be it's got to be bottom up and top down, hasn't it? You can't yeah. you can't just work on one in 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 communities in countries where um, where it's stigmatized to be LGBTQI uh, or illegal. Um, we have to we have to refute that because that's a violation of rights, and we have to work with those communities, and we are failing to do that. Mm -hmm. um, at the 
um, global level, um, we haven't applied ourselves to think, and in spite of all the best efforts of 42 degrees, we, we need to keep doing this. We have to um, we have to look at why the SDGs don't refer to LGBTIQ people. Why, when we do joint needs assessments, um, are there not hardwired questions there about vulnerabilities around sexuality and, and sexual identity? Um, how can how can we make sure that when we when we kick off a response that we have hardwired into that response a coordination that looks at this and and and, and that could be through the protection cluster or the health cluster I, it doesn't really matter i mean for me i would want to signal that it's so important that that should be a function that would be much higher like at the hct level or the intercluster coordination level um we've successfully done that with um with sexual exploitation and abuse right we've now um, got the standing orders changed of the ISC, um, that when there is a scale up or a level three um, crisis that we that we have a uh, safeguarding PSEAH advisor um, uh, uh, beside the um, humanitarian coordinator, ensuring that we are doing all we can to manage the risks of sexual exploitation and abuse. Mm -hmm. This is a separate issue, but no less important. And yeah that's an area that we need to work at and I think that's where we can be quite strategic right mm -hmm. that we can we can look at all of these um bits of the system that are clunky and um and you know still still working although not really fit for purpose and we can really challenge them I was trying to I was recently drafting um the humanitarian funding guidance for for FCDO and um at the front of that document, it's, I think it's quite good, actually, um, uh, worth a look if you're interested. We've got a long list there of the, um, the the guidelines and the ISC standards on the key issues that we that we care about. Um, and we were struggling with um, LGBTQI guidance. There is nothing in the ISC space that needs to change. And that and that's a place where I'm really really keen to be an advocate and to support what you do um to to look at work through the, the working group that you're in um but yeah i think that's an area where we can look at the top down uh, and make sure that we are um that we are considering um this within i don't care which agenda the inclusion agenda <laughs> the protection agenda <laughs> um, we're missing we're missing something massive here right yeah, yeah. We can get onto that in a moment because I have real thoughts about that and not shoeholding everything in the protection um, cluster. But um, we do have a question here from Laura who asks, um, do we have any insights into how we can progress a on a twin track um, approach, mainstream and specialised organisations working alongside each other? How do we strengthen and encourage more mainstreaming rather than just advancing specialist orgs that won't have that reach? Ooh. Well, mm. I think that maybe it's this this reflection that, 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 you know, let's identify what the key guidances are and let's target them to make sure that the guidance that NGOs are obliged to follow by donors respect the best practice in this stuff. So let's work more with CHS and um, less, I guess, with, with Sphere, although Sphere is also very, I think, important. Um, mm. There I, is I a small mention in being... Sphere now. Right, right, yeah, but it's insufficient, right? They yeah. could do a lot more. Um, I could see this is a great project for the H2H network, you know, that I'm very involved in, um, to look at how we really get get this thinking and this language right um because you know once you once once you get that into the guidance um once you get a couple of big donors who are influential and you know that 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 we should be you know pushing dfat we should be pushing fcda we should be pushing echo and usaid um to come together so donors some donor consensus because once the donors are saying guys you know, you're marginalizing this group, whether it's legal or illegal to be gay in Indonesia, you're marginalizing these people and they are vulnerable. Mm. Um, uh, so I think it's a it's a mainstreaming issue. You don't have to be an LGBT organization, right, to work on this stuff. Yeah. You yeah. have to be an organization that cares and wants to leave no one behind, which I think we yeah. all 
as humanitarians claim to be. Yeah. So there's not really any excuse. Um, I think that I think the first thing about mainstreaming or, and, and mainstream organisations is that um, are those organisations set up to be inclusive themselves or, or are their policies and practices internally and externally reinforcing stigma and discrimination? You know, so, for example, they'll have... Um, a uh, gender in shelter assessment that continues to say women and girls, you know, must be able to access hygiene kits um, or, um, you know, talking about populations as women and girls, men and boys. Um, and so they take this binary approach that doesn't see the diversity of gender that exists. They make, you know, cis normative assumptions that only cisgendered women and girls need hygiene kits. Um, you know, and these are just two very small examples of embedded systemic discrimination within organisations and how that comes out in attendance sheets for workshops or rapid needs assessments or um, free distribution queues or, you know, um, you know, shelters that have... Um, you know, set up to accommodate families, but a family looks a particular heteronormative way. And so I think mm. that rather than just assuming that, you know, mainstream organisations have to get out there and do the work, I think that the first thing they have to do is look at themselves and look at their internal policies and their internal practices and do the work to make themselves inclusive um, of diverse mm. OG-esque. And then I mm. think... It's about thinking about when you're working with um, specialist organisations, what are the, um, the social and legal aspects that you need to take into account, you know, and what are you doing to make sure that um, you can work ethically and sustainably with small LGBT organisations? There's so much emphasis on... Um, uh, appraisal processes of small CSOs, like, are you are you good enough to work with us? Do you have the right, you know, financial and accounting systems and so forth? But there's little emphasis mm. on, are those big mainstream organisations ethically and appropriately set up to work with small CSOs and mm. working with them considerately, working with them in local, cultural, appropriate ways? Um, mm. And I guess that's another way that we can think about localization as well. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's another uh, another interesting point that just popped into my head is um, um, this whole idea about um, certification of organisations against the core humanitarian standard, mm. and this idea that if you're audited against the nine pillars, um, then that provides a satisfaction that 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 these things that you're describing are in place and that actually wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just have a chs certification well it exists already but it's not that that used um that 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 would be a great way to make sure that we could channel resourcing to local organizations but also you know not just finance and risk and all those things but as you say um behaving properly i think we i think we do need to look at the sector because there's a lot of variation between um, organizations and some that I think do this work incredibly well I was just looking at the um, the Trocra program the Irish CAFOD um, in in Myanmar um, and how effectively they've handed over all control to a local partner um, and they they've been very honest in describing that that really hurt that letting go of power wasn't wasn't easy but they've done it so I think we need to do some more learning I think I can see I can see us trying to commission some work. I'm sorry, I'm not speaking as FTO, but uh, you know, let's take some of these tools and let's audit them uh, from a point of view of inclusion of um, Sojesk communities, mm. and let's see how we can how we can improve them. I think that's that'll be a really exciting and a really productive way. Um, I had one other point about yeah about sort of scale up and size. Look, I think Edge Effect is 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 fantastic, and I think that you know you're like one of these typical 
organizations that are the most exciting in the sector because although you're tiny you're you know you're almost like a coronavirus you're just tiny microscopic organization that's having an enormous impact um you know i'm sorry i'm going back to my other podcast where i talk about cockroaches and rats and vectors <laughs> but um just just amazing i mean you are well let's kind of use a kind of a biblical kind of you're the yeast in the dough right and um that just to see how that's spreading and how that's enriching the sector and that's you know why the work that you do is so important we are so patriarchal we're so heteronormative uh we're so bureaucratic as an organ as a as an ecosystem um it's it's people like you the real kind of banksies and extinction rebellions of the humanitarian world that are challenging and are disrupting and are asking these imperative questions which is so essential yeah. i'm glad proud of you <laughs> um atria says in a q a it's not about funding local and community based but letting them lead um and i guess um I guess for me, I think that there's, I think to some degree, it's about working together as well. Like, for example, with LGBTIQ plus CSOs that we work with, they're doing some amazing stuff. Like, for example, um, in Cyclone Gita, the Tonga Ladies Association in Tonga, um, their, their office is also a shelter for ladies who have been kicked out of home. Um, and this is in pre-emergency spaces. Um, there's lots of work that we have done with them where we've been shared, lots of people have shared stories with us that ladies, for example, in a humanitarian crisis won't go to the emergency shelters because the emergency shelters are traditionally churches. They're the strongest, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. literal building. Um, and at times there's two things that are happening either they're worried they won't be accepted or they know they won't be accepted and so they will do some work that is you know they handed out um they they housed as many people as they could they handed out things like fresh water and so forth um from their building which was damaged um but also i have to acknowledge and and that they're not humanitarian experts they do an amazing job working with their community, but their, their HIV AIDS um, is most of their funding. They do really good work doing that in their communities. That's what they're really mm. passionate about. That's where their background is. Um, mm. You know, that's where their funding comes from. And would that be putting, you know, asking them to lead a humanitarian response for for LGBT people in Tonga, is that asking them to do things that they're not set up to do? And, you know, maybe, you know, it's it's not, you know, where they're at as an organization. Yeah, look, I wouldn't wish a humanitarian disaster on any country or or indeed a humanitarian aid worker influx into any country. Mm. <laughs> and um yeah, we're a pretty a pretty broad bunch of weirdos and misfits, right? So, mm. yeah, and I, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't wish my best friends to to, to necessarily be that. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, places like the Pacific and mo most places in the global south are abandoned. So we mm. there's going to be no international search and rescue response after an earthquake or a, or a tsunami in, in Vanuatu, right? They'll be on their own. Hmm. So. Yeah, there's not even think, a NGO in Tonga. There's, um, right. yeah, they, they, right. they stay in, in Fiji. And if hmm. there is an emergency, they will consider a response going out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, I think we have to say, you don't have to be a humanitarian to, to, to be ready to respond to these kind of uh, incidents in your community, right? Mm. And, um, and and try and support them as much as they can, and rec and celebrate them, and mm. recognize what heroes they are. Um, yeah. And 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 it's it's yeah, it's really interesting that a lot of the kind of the great work 
uh, has come out of the HIV AIDS um, community, hasn't it? And, and a lot of my HIV um, campaign people here, mates here, who are currently really campaigning hard to have a memorial for the the the, the, the victims of um, of HIV. Um, they, they, you know, they've 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 become really vocal advocates for the SOGS community, but that has come from the medical kind of health health side of, of, of the of the AIDS pandemic mm. um, and yeah mm. it's, 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 it's interesting but um another really but, great story that I have um, working in the Versailles in the Philippines um, okay. and working... I was there for Yolanda ah um, so you would know from say for example uh, tropical cyclone Yolanda slash Haiyan um, yeah just for others uh, in the global, in, in the physical um, south, um, in the Oceania area where we call it um, Haiyan, uh, that because the system, the humanitarian system, isn't set up to include LGBT people for all sorts of reasons, um, there's this amazing um, lesbian network throughout, and they're called Lesgrip. And so when an emergency happens, um, you know, they, they activate their networks, they donate tins and candles and matches and non-perishable um, items, and they get in their vans and they drive and they distribute um, the, the goods throughout the community because they know that for all sorts of reasons, um, the diverse OGS community won't be a, won't be recipients of the aid that exists, um, and so I thought that's a really good example of of um, I guess local first responders and, and local response. Yeah, but no, again, that, that's I, I, because I was... the humanitarian system doesn't do it itself. Yeah. Right. Right. Totally. Now I was really um, inspired by. Um, the community that I met in in Tacloban and um, other towns in 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 the Visayas and uh, yeah and so it's like another you know a flip side of of marginalizing the community is that you don't benefit from the community right they mm. brought so much to that response so much creativity so much energy um, so much passion so much really just hardcore humanitarian response and, and protection mm. and aid and support to vulnerable people um that we're also missing this huge thing if we if we're not including the um the community um in terms of them as responders right we need to welcome them and celebrate them yeah and i think um also and i do this too um but stop always referring to them as vulnerable communities because there there is so much strength and resilience in these communities as well and it makes me think of um, this uh, person uh, in Fiji after Cyclone Winston, Tropical Cyclone Winston, um, when we were doing the, the research for Down by the River. And I was talking to a person who identified as Bakuseo Leo Lewa, which um, is culturally the closest thing that you might say is trans woman. And she was telling me how what her strengths are and she was like well you know I I can do men's work and I can do women's work you know the community is discriminating against me they're they're telling me that you know I'm to blame or my community is to blame for this disaster for our sins but really when we're there we we can do any work and we support our communities and we're here you know in in the response um, we shouldn't be discriminated against. And no, they shouldn't be discriminated against, but also there's so much strength there and, and working with mm. communities around not what their vulnerabilities are, but what their strengths are is I think a really important part of localization. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, that when, when you have a disaster, all the underlying prejudice and you know um, stigma and violence it just gets amplified, right? As well, so mm. it's all the more reason that we that we need to celebrate them and and work and, and work with these this this group. Um, and 
you know, as yeah, it's like you know, how do you know? Just as we recognise that we recognise people living with disability, um, just as we're starting to recognise people with mental health issues, um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a vulnerability. Your sexuality shouldn't you know, it's a defined characteristic, right? But because mm -hmm. of their sexuality, people are being treated really differently, and therefore it's an imperative that we that we do work with them we do celebrate them but we also are sensitive to these really difficult um circumstances in which they find themselves with national governments and persecution um and, and so yeah i think that's one of the tricky issues isn't it for mainstream so-called mainstream organizations is how to navigate that balance between you know really protecting people's identity their rights that you know the the potential harm that can be done of people being identified as as um so esque in very you know harsh cultures so i, I think that's yeah that's a, that's a massive problem isn't it mm. yeah no it is it's um we we only have four minutes left we've nearly <sighs> run out of the hour already um you and I were talking about how nervous we'd be, but we're fine. Is there any last questions from the from the attendees that they would like us to to answer um, in the last four minutes? Um, I can take this one. Um, the, the white savior model is a patriarchal characteristic of human human How do we dismantle the patriarchy while the colonizing humanitarian action that's the question right mm. but um i really uh, sorry to drop a name um but i really love jermaine greer i don't know if she's very famous in your part of the world she's quite a famous feminist from australia and basically she says that um the opposite of patriarchy is not matriarchy but it's actually fraternity or sorority mm. and um we we need to we need to carry on what we're doing um the, the coin is dropping right um the, the reason why again why you're so important to the system is you're challenging um challenging a patriarchy with a way of seeing the ecosystem as a kind of consensual anarchy which is really important and i hope that vitality continues and i think you know even if the even if a, mi a minority is a minority of one person the truth is still the truth and i think mm. we've got the truth mm. I'm going to be really controversial here. And as a someone, my dad's Fijian, my mum's Scottish. Um, so I do understand colonialism really well. And I, I think that rather than decolonization, I don't think we can go back. I think we've lost so much. I think that there's so much embedded in there that I think we need to move to a post-colonial world. Um, and I don't think that we have. I think colonialism still exists in different forms. Um, but I think we need to, to go to a post-colonial world where um, we're bringing all of our learnings along with it, but we're also bringing a rights-based approach, which will help us to dismantle patriarchy. Um, yeah. So I guess we've got two minutes left. So what are your takeaways from this conversation? Um, I feel really energized and um, it's really helped me to think through a lot more about the role that I can play in my in my job as 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 a humanitarian advocate within a government. Um, luckily for I think the, the UK still is really focused on humanitarian action and and there's still some space that we can do some really good work. So I think I'd I'd like to have another conversation and start looking at how we commit to um, looking at the top down piece of this and mm. making a difference there. Um, and as well as just sending out all the, all the love and support and, and cheers and hoorays for the, all the work that you do at the, at the grassroots as well. And actually in my heart of hearts, I wish I could be working at the grassroots level instead, because it's sometimes lonely up in government. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've gone backwards and forwards over my career. <laughs> um, and even as, you know, in, in my position, I do both strategy and practice sometimes. 
Um, I think my takeaway is that there's so much for us to explore. There's so much that hasn't been done. There's so much that we haven't even considered. Like this really is a, an extraordinarily new space, really, that we're working in. Um, and we need to just really acknowledge that and I think not rush into it, but take it slowly but surely because there, there really is so much complexity and so much that we have to do. And we really need to, to do our best to bring everyone along with us. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, but I think we're climbing the mountain and it always feels tough until you yeah. get to the top. Yeah. It does. So thank you for all of your kind words tonight because it does feel tough sometimes. Okay, we're going to say goodbye and um, Anna's going to put on the, a, a small slide that's going to show everyone our next, our next webinars. Um, but I want to thank you so very, very much for your time and energy and your friendship um, and just trusting me enough to have a conversation with me where we're being provocative and honest. Um, so thank you so much, Fergus. Fantastic to talk. Stay in touch.